Hello, Bobby here, and for today's gameplay video, I'm coming to you not with a league, but with a grudge match against Derek Pite, probably better known as Misplaced Ginger, the Rakdos mid-range expert. I'll do more setup, but let's get right into the games, and I'll give you the rest of the introduction. Now, Derek is a fantastic content creator, and you probably know him for being the most public Rakdos mid-range expert in Pioneer. If you play against Rakdos when playing Pioneer, you should assume that your opponent is playing Derek's list and copying his sideboard plans. I myself, personally, I watch his stream very frequently. I'd say in the last year, I've watched approximately 60% of all the Pioneer streams that he's done. Um, and the point of this is to keep a pulse on the format, both what is happening with the format broadly, but also what Derek himself personally is thinking. Now, where this grudge match came from is Derek has made the claim that Rakdos is favored against Green, and these two decks, they form the best decks of the format. Green and Rakdos, they sort of push out each other's bad matchups, where if one deck tries to hard target one very specifically, then the other deck will beat it. And so what I proposed to Derek, since I disagree with his claim that Rakdos is favored against Green, is we'd play a series of five matches, and we'll alternate who's on the play and who's on the draw. So Derek won the die roll, so he gets to be first this, first this match, but we'll alternate who's on the play and draw regardless of who wins. I'll, I'll link to Derek's content down below and include the deck list and the sideboard guide and everything else you'll, you'll, you'll need. With that, let's get into actually commentating on, on the game. So something that's going to be a recurring theme in all the games you see me play against Rakdos is don't mulligan. Like regardless of the composition of your hand, just don't mulligan. I'll get into more specifics about numbers behind this for the next game, but I, I keep this hand, I'll keep basically any seven card hand. Um, so here in terms of opening, so Derek Mulligan to five, which is very fortunate to me, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. And I lead on an elf and a wolf will haven after that gets pushed. And here my mana is a little bit awkward because if I want to deploy both wolf willow havens, I need to put one of the wolf willows on the Nykthos. That's just sort of the way the mana situation works out. And so I, the re there are reasons why you want to put Wolf Willow Haven on Nykthos, in that when you then activate the Nykthos, it's kind of like giving a virtual extra devotion because it makes the Nykthos tap for green. But it's also can be awkward in two ways. One, you might not have the two spare mana to activate the devotion ability of Nykthos. And then the second is if you play a second copy of Nykthos later, you'll legend rule the old one and lose not only the the, the old Nykthos, but also the Wolf Willow Haven that's on top of the Nykthos. And then the, the, I guess one last way that putting a Wolf Willow on a Nykthos is awkward is Cavalier of Thorns. It's not a May ability. And so if you hit only a Nykthos and no other lands, you're obligated to put the Nykthos into play and Legend Rule the old one. So that's sort of the reason why you don't want to do it. But here I'm sort of forced to. So here I double Wolf Willow both of my lands. And I uh, get my Karn to rest. But I top deck a very good card, which is Cavalier of Thorns. And here I'm hoping I don't hit exactly Nykthos and no other lands, because then I will be, like, net down. And so I see the Nykthos, and I have a, like, you know, get a little concerned. But thankfully, there's two other lands I can choose, so I'm not forced to, to Legend Rule my own Nykthos and lose that Wolf of Haven, because I, I do really kind of need that mana. Now here, Derek draws a Go for the Throat and is able to take out my Cavalier of Thorns. And I, I should clarify, I mean, obviously, when I'm playing the games, I can't see his hand like I edited the hand in from his stream of the games so that it's easier for you the viewer to be able to see what's going on I mean obviously I, I didn't see his hand while we were playing and so he go for the throats my cavalier of thorns and I have a pretty stock graveyard and it might surprise you that the card I choose to get back is forest and the reason for that is I want to be able to play the Pelucranos and then um, to have two other mana sources to activate the devotion on Nykthos to play storm the festival and here you're actually seeing the tension I mentioned before with putting the Nykthos on, the Wolf of Haven on Nykthos, is that it makes it harder to have the two other mana you need to spare after playing something to have the mana to activate the Devotion ability on Nykthos. So you're actually seeing that right here. And so I Storm, off, I, put, I get the Forest back off of the Cavalier trigger, I go Pelucranos, Forest, um, Cavalier off the Storm. And the reason why I got Forest here instead of Elf is that if... I hit exactly Nykthos off of this Cavalier of Thorns. What that will allow me to do is um, have you know the two mana I need to activate Nykthos again. And I actually would have storm or would have Cavaliered into the Nykthos, so I would have been able to storm a second time. But um, 
Derek just scooped it up already before even needing to get to that point. Because he did, he did a mulligan to five this game. So that's good for, you know, me that he mulligan to five that I didn't, you know, need more things to, to go right. But it sort of just happened this way. In terms of sideboarding, so sideboarding is always going to be the same against Rakdos. You board in Darkstill Citadel and a Seekus Chariot. And the reason for a Seekus Chariot is easy. It's because you want more even mana values, because all, all, basically all your creatures are odd mana value between Elf, Pelucranos, Old Growth Troll, Cavalier of Thorns. Everything except for Cityscape, the one of Cityscape Leveler, is going to be an odd mana value. And Derek is going to board out three of his four Bone Crusher Giants and both of his Graveyard Trespassers, and so he's going to have basically no odds left in his deck except for a flipped Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Um, so that's the Seekus Chariot, and the reason for Darkstill Citadel is because... Elves are very bad mana sources in this matchup. Like, everything kills an elf. And you may look at, the, you know, the early drops and see there's a lot of, you know, triple green cards or a lot of just single green one drops. However, the game's going to go on for a long number of turns if you win. And you just need reliable mana sources. And el elves are not reliable mana sources, especially with Extinction Event in the mix, because that answers all of the elves. And... If you want to be able to, you know, cast your five and six drops through a bunch of removal and discard, then you need, um, you need reliable mana. And so here you can see that there's this hand I have of two colorless lands, uh, Oath of Nyssa, Wolf Will Haven, and some, you know, triple green cards. And you might think, Bobby, this is an automatic mulligan, but you would be wrong. And I'm actually going to go into my sort of little tirade here on mulliganing against Rakdos specifically, but that is, you should never mulligan against Rakdos basically ever. You should ne just not do it. Um, I have specific numbers to, to back this up. So let's see here. Specifically, so against Rakdos, so my win rate in matches against Rakdos is 77%. I've played against it 79 times, and I've won 61 of those, and I've lost 18. So I, I do win these matches against Rakdos. And the thing is, when you're playing a ramp combo deck against a Thought Seize deck, you're just not allowed to mulligan. Because if you mulligan, you'll be down a card, and you'll still get Thought Seized, and you'll still just lose. Um, and just to give concrete numbers on, on how much I build, because I do, I do have a moto tracker to track this sort of thing. So, uh, against, if you average against all decks in the format, if you look at the average number of times per game that I mulligan, it's 0 0.3 mulligans per game. So, uh, on a per game basis, I mulligan an average of 0 0.3 times. However, against Rakdos specifically, I mulligan less than half as much. I mulligan 0 0.14 times per game on average. So I mulligan half as, like, more than half as little against Rakdos as I do against any other deck on the format, in the format on average. And, and, and it works. You can see it in the win rate. And the, the opposite of that against a deck like, uh, like Lotus Field, like the Hidden Strings combo deck. This is also a deck where I have an extremely good win rate. So my win rate against Hidden Strings, I uh, played against it. 32 times and I've won 27 times and lost five times. So I win 84% of my matches against Hidden Strings. And they're actually mulligan twice as much as I do on average. I mulligan an average of 0.6 times per game. And so there, basically there are certain matchups in the format where you either have to mulligan a lot or very little. And so against Rakdos specifically, you basically are just not allowed to mulligan because if you mulligan, they'll still have the Thoughtseize, they'll still have the removal spell, they'll still have, you know, a threat and you'll just be down a card. So this is just part of the reality of playing a ramp combo deck against an attrition Thoughtseize deck, and you just not allowed to mulligan. So you can see in that game what happened is, you know, I drew the green source on turn two, and I played a Wolf Wolfhaven on my land, and Derek didn't have a threat, and I won. And I don't think this is even that unreasonable of an outcome. Like, even if there was one threat on his side of the board, I still think I, you know, could pretty reasonably win if I just have a green source in my top two cards. And I think I could also still win if I had a green source like as my third card down. But I think I'm a pretty heavy favorite to win if my second card down is a green source. First or second. So basically this is a long way of saying like you, you should not mulligan against Rakdos. Like if you have anything remotely close to a functional hand, you, you should not mulligan against Rakdos with, with green. And sometimes you will like lose a game and you will look silly and that is just part of the reality of playing green. Like you need the emotional maturity to look like your deck accomplished literally nothing in games when you lose because you need to do the thing that maximizes your equity to win, even though it might feel like you don't have agency, the agency comes in the deck choice and not necessarily in the, the gameplay. So th this is just reality. So if, if you are playing green and you find yourself losing against Rakdos, the answer is you, you are almost certainly mulligating too much and you should just keep literally every seven card hand if you can help it. I think in this entire series of grud matches, I think I mulligan 
twice because the hands were like not even close to being functional, even if like, you know, multiple things went right. So I, like I mulliganed and I lost, but you just can't mulligan. It's just not reality. You, you have to keep like basically every seven card hand. But okay, so that, that was that was the first match that so we won that. So I'm going to go back to describing what's going on in this match. So here there was a little bit of tension on this turn about whether I play the Karn or whether I go for the Wolf Willow Haven and the Old Growth Troll. The thing about Karn is I could have Karned and gotten Sky Sovereign, but then if my opponent had a stomp on my Karn and I didn't draw the fifth mana source, then it would be I would be able to like deploy the Sky Sovereign and my Karn could just get like maybe attack down. One thing that that's Ginger's list has going on right now is that it doesn't have Dreadbore anymore, so there's it's a little more okay to just sort of play out a card to an empty board and 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 plus it to preserve the optionality. But here I ended up deciding to go for the ramp plus deploying the old growth troll. And here when I when I oath, I had a little bit of tension here between I could get the Nykthos and like have a good card turn, or I could just get Cavalier of Thorns. I went Cavalier of Thorns, um, which I guess looking at his hand now it looks like it worked out pretty well because there was in braid so if i had gone for like a sky sovereign line it wouldn't have panned out the way i wanted the the downside for the line that i did end up going for is that it's pretty weak to thought seize so the, the chapter two on fable just went off and if derek had been able to draw into a thought seize or one of his main deck copies of the rest he has one main deck to rest two side and four main deck copies of thought seize. so if he had drawn into a thought seize here i i think i realistically could have lost this game um, but the reason why I went with the the Cavalier particularly is just because the the, like the volume of threats you have is pretty important, and Karn is like always going to be a Karn in the future. But I just wanted like sort of access, sort of like one more guaranteed, you know, like action card in Cavalier. And thankfully, the the Fable trigger didn't draw into a Thought Seize, and so this this got to pan out nicely, which which is good. So in this turn, so here what I go for is so I want to play the card and be able to defend it. And so here what I'm going to go for is a Seekus Chariot. And that's going to give me like two blockers and the ability to sort of defend my card even if it gets stomped. Um, and this, this is going to end up working out pretty well. The other thing that's a consideration here is getting a Restorative Burst. And so this is in case Derek has two stomps, getting that would be nice. I can't play the Restorative Burst on this turn. But I could play it like two turns from now if my card gets attacked down. But the problem is like if Derek has just like a normal Doom Blade effect, like another go for the throat effect, and is able to kill my Cavalier of Thorns and attack down my Karn, I kind of have no real route to protecting the Karn I would get back with the restorative burst. So here I'm more interested in getting Battlefield Presence to defend the Karn. So in here here I draw a pretty good card actually. So here I draw a Kiora. And so what Kiora allows me to do is I can sack the aura version of old growth troll and that lets me draw a card and then um kiora can untap the old growth troll and i can have it as a blocker and then karn can plus on the asikas chariot and have it be another blocker so now i've got you know five blockers ready to go um to defend my karn and so on the next turn i can minus karn for cityscape level or blow up the shield and like it's kind of impossible to lose from there one one nice thing that did happen is that the old growth troll token draw hit a Beseju, and so what this is going to allow me to do is take out the reflection of Kiki Jiki, and I'm going to wait to do this until after combat because if I do it now, like the key, there's nothing threatening for the Kiki Jiki to copy because it can't copy legendary creatures, and so I want to deny Derek the option of like animating the den and getting a big attack in because if he, if he doesn't animate the den, I, I will shoot the den because again there's like no good creatures for the Kiki Jiki to copy. But one thing that here that was a small mistake, and this is just something that I missed, is um, when you crew your legendary vehicles, they are legendary creatures, and so it gives you a one mana discount on Beseju. And this comes up pretty frequently with, say, Sky Sovereign, so I, I don't miss it when it comes to Sky Sovereign. Or even if you animate with Karn the Mightstone Weakstone, because that's also legendary, so that comes up non frequently, like remembering to that, that gives you a discount on Beseju. But I guess Asika's Chariot, less and less over time, it comes up. Um, and so I just forgot that I was going to get the discount on Beseju, and so I forgot to play my Elf because I, I would be able to cast or to channel my Beseju for just one mana. So that was that was a small mistake. And um, let's see here. So Derek's going to go for the Graveyard Trespasser, and I'm going to respond to this by taking out the Reflection of Kiki Jiki, so that he can't like try to burn me out by copying it um, a bunch. 
because that otherwise that's you know a, th a super theoretical way that I could like lose the game. But um, on my next turn, you're gonna see me Karn for Cityscape Leveler, and I'm gonna use a Cityscape Leveler to blow up the Shield Rid, and that's gonna be basically the end of the game. Uh, one fun thing that will get to happen is I'll get to use the Asikas Chariot to copy the Troll Warrior token off of Old Growth Troll that has come up maybe three times total in my last 1,000 matches. So that, that's pretty fun. Um, that comes up pretty infrequently, and it's a creature with four power entering the battlefield, so you get to draw a card with Kiora. Like I mentioned, this comes up very infrequently, so I, I, it's possible I might have missed that in paper. Um, but we're playing on Magic Online, so, so I didn't, which is nice. Um, one one relevant thing I'll actually mention now, so I'm going to be Cityscape leveler in this shield rid, is that Cityscape leveler, the destroy and make a power stone, is a cast trigger. And so this means when you cast the Cityscape leveler and it destroys the shield rid, that happens before the Cityscape leveler resolves. So you'll destroy the shield rid and then the Cityscape leveler resolves, and that's a creature with four, power 4 greater entering the battlefield, so then you draw a card of Cure, but you don't take 2 damage from the shield rid, so that's, that's nice. So we're going to... Next game, and remember, I said you, you just don't mulligan against reactive. So like, if your hand is remotely close to being functional, you just don't mulligan. Um, here we're seeing sort of the, the limits of that. So here, remember, I, I just sideboarded out two two elves, and I have an opener now with three elves, um, which is unfortunate because, like I said, elves are elves are the worst mana sources because they die. Um, and so I still keep this hand because I'm not I'm not going to six. Like this hand is not bad enough to go to six, but it is bad. And so I play an elf, and all you know, my elves are gonna die. Um, it's noteworthy here that so here Derek shocks himself for a blood crypt and passes. And there's only one thing that could be. It could only be like another fatal push. And so here I don't cast my elf because, um, like, I if he does have a three drop he wants to play next turn or and a four drop the following turn, then it adds a little bit of tension there for just like throwing off his curve a little bit to have to play. The, the fatal push on a future turn. So I don't I don't play the elf here. Um and I get oh wow. Okay, so yeah, I mean I'm seeing sort of his, his hand for the first time now, but so he had a topic all in there, so that was, you know, pretty good for him. Um but here you're seeing why elves are pretty weak mana sources where they just die to removal spells. And here, you know, this Dark Steel Citadel, like, even if this had been an elf instead of a Dark Steel Citadel, it wouldn't really have accomplished anything because like I was still gated on green mana this game. Like the only green producing land this whole time has been the Beseju. Um so that wouldn't really have accomplished anything. And so you always need the triple green to like triple green to get to the old growth troll, but for casting, you know, your Cavalier of Thorns, your Karns, you know, Kiora, Storm the Festival, Dark Citadel contributes to all of these things. You'll you'll see in like other spots in the future where Dark Citadel is is good. Um but yeah, here it's just I had a three elf hand, and elves are the worst mana source. If, if I had some, if I could like you know had access to like an unbounded number of sideboard slots, like not unbounded, like let's say like double it. One thing I would be interested in is having you know a large number of like lands and sylvan carry to just replace elves with, because el el elves elves truly like do not do anything um, besides eat your opponent's removal spells. So here I, I draw a Karn, you know, after a, a green source, which is, I mean, it's not going to be enough to win, but I get Woodcaller Automaton here. And this actually brings up one of the other reasons why Woodcaller Automaton is good is so if, especially with Dark Steel Citadel, so this is why I board Dark Steel Citadel in is because you're basically never going to have time to wish for the land with Dark Steel Citadel in a game that you're winning. There are other matches where you do, but this is not one of them. And if you can use Woodcrawler Automaton to make Dark Steel Citadel into a creature, that's actually really good in this matchup because it's an indestructible 3-3. The only answers they have to an indestructible 3-3 are uh, one, Extinction Event on even, which they don't want to do because basically all their creatures are even post-board. It's the Shaman Token, Blood Tithe Harvester, Misery Shadow, and Shield Rid. The only odds they have are like one copy of Bone Crusher Giant and flipped Fable of the of Kiki Jiki. So... Having that is pretty good. Oh, sorry. So Extinction Event on Even is one answer, and then the other one is Blood Tithe Harvester. But usually they're going to need, like, Kiki Jiki copying Blood Tithe Harvesters to have, you know, the two bloods late in the game to take out your Indestructible 3-3. Three, three. 
But the thing is, if your opponent has access to Kiki Jiki and Blood Tide Harvester, your Karn should almost certainly just get Sky Sovereign instead to answer the the reflection of Kiki Jiki. So, well, I guess where I'm going with this is that Dark Shield Citadel plus Ward Collar Tom is extremely good, and according to my data, it comes up in about 10% of games of post board games against Rakdos, and I've I've won all of those games. Um, so when it does come up, it's like very powerful the ability to to do this, um, and this is one of the reasons why you should play Dark Steel Citadel and not Treasure Vault. Um, I, I have like you know this tweet thread where I talk about playing sort of whatever you want in your sideboard slots, and I'm not I try not to be prescriptive about the composition of the sideboard slots, but um, if you, the, the, I will break that rule exactly once in this context, which is if you are playing Treasure Vault, you're you're wrong. Um, do not do not do it. Um, I actually recommend if you're going to play Treasure Vault to just like play a different deck. That's like the honest answer. Um, if you think you need the black mana from Treasure Vault for the combo, there I can link a tweet down below that explains the process to to the where you don't need it. But just do do not play Treasure Vault if you're going to play a land. Play Dark Citadel or like play a different deck. Or you can also not play the you know Dark Citadel. That's fine too. But um, don't 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 play Treasure Vault in, in your sideboard of this deck. Um, so that, that's my mini rant on, on Dark Shit Citadel and Treasure Vault. Like, so getting back to this game. So here, you know, I just kept, you know, any, you know, remotely functional hand. And there's, you know, some removal spells that have happened. There's, you know, some discard spells. And, you know, I'm just playing out my cards. So I've got a troll. And here's something that I'm concerned about is... So you, you always want to be thinking about Extinction Event. Like, it, you, if you can play around Extinction Event to whatever extent you can, you you want to. And so here, you know, if I could if I could play the Storm, if I drew a land and I could play the Storm, I'd play the Storm instead of the Cavalier of Thorns because I want to force the Extinction Event on when I only have, like, sort of, like, maybe one relevant creature in play. But here, I play out the Cavalier of Thorns, and the reason for that is even if I get Extinction Evented, if I can just find any land off of the Cavalier of Thorns, which I do, I actually find a pretty good land, Dark Souls Citadel, then... I'll be able to storm you to make an extinction evented. And here I can't get both extinction evented and have my storm thought seized in the same turn because the, the, there's no, this is about to be the, like the fourth mana coming um, if, if he draws it, which he doesn't. But in general, you want the way you play around extinction event is to try to not have too many very good cards in play um, that are odd mana value creatures if you can help it. And usually what happens is, I mean, your Rector's opponent will, you know, basically always have, you know, you know, a Fable of the Mirror Breaker on turn three. And so something, something you want to do is you try to only have, like, one good creature in play until the turn where the Fable's about to flip. And you want to deploy all your stuff on the turn where they're going to untap with the third chapter going off and having a flipped Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Because then if they have to Extinction Event, they're forced to Extinction Event their own Fable. Because that the mana value stays the same on both sides, even though all the other characteristics are overridden. So it like, for example, Fable doesn't give any devotion when it's flipped over into reflection of Kiki Jiki, but it does still have mana value three. And so you want to force into extinction event that away with all of your odds. Now here it didn't come up because there was no Fable. And also thankfully it looks like Ginger never drew up fourth land to go with this extinction event. But even if he had, you know, I could have still played Storm. Although luckily I top deck the Cityscape leveler and I could destroy the the Misery Shadow, and so that sort of made the game sort of wrapped up pretty nicely, but even if I hadn't drawn that, like, the Storm still would have been pretty good. Because um, I would have, you know, I was attacking for nine this turn, so I'm threatening to put him down to four, I would have stormed into let's see, probably Kiora Troll, and so that would have been in a good spot, but I drew City's Cave level, so I won. So that was pretty good. Um, so that was match two. I'm up two matches to zero. You know, the scrudge match is looking like it's going pretty good for me. And here, you know, we're going into into game into match three, game one. Um, and here I have an even remotely close to functional seven card hand. I'm going to keep it because you just keep literally every seven card hand if you can help it against Rakdos. That's, that's just how it works. And if you're losing too much against Rakdos with green, you should, the biggest thing you can do is probably just mulligan less. So... I have, you know, a bunch of O's, and O's and multiples, you know, aren't great because they don't contribute to devotion because they're legendary, but I don't know, still kind of like a ponder. Here, I actually have a pretty interesting decision with this particular Oath. Troll is an amazing card in this matchup, especially in game one because there's no clean answers to Troll. 
However, I don't have a reliable third green mana source here. Like, I don't have another forest. Um, and so there is an argument for... I already have a troll in hand, so there is an argument for taking the troll and also the forest. Here, I try to go for the high roll, where I take the troll and try to get a forest on the next oath. Which works out, thankfully. I'm not even going to like risk the cure, because, you know, if, say, there's a discard spell that gets run and it takes the cure, that could put me in a pretty bad spot. But thankfully, it works out. And so here I just able to, you know, slam trolls and Old World Troll is such an amazing card against Reactors, especially in game one. It's just like immortal, you get devotion, it makes mana if it dies. Like there's nothing to not love about Old World Troll. It's just the best card. And so some stuff is gonna happen, but like it's not, you know, gonna make a, a huge difference here. Here I have a little bit of an interesting choice if I want to deploy some more creatures or if I want to play the Karn. Here I'm pretty interested in killing the um, the Shieldred. And the thing about the like the creatures, like the the green green creatures, is your know, Shieldred has Death Touch. So if I want to be able to play around a removal spell. On one of them, if I go for a double block, I need to have three in play and triple block, which I can't deploy them all this turn. So I think here the safer thing to do is to just... Because I play the elf, that gives me five devotion, so I play Karn with one mana floating, and I can get Mightstone Weakstone, which is um, an answer to Shieldred, and then play the elf. And so I have you know access to up to three blockers, and I can play the Mightstone Weakstone. And here you... And the Mightstone Weakstone has a rider on it where you can't use the mana to cast non-artifact spells, but you can just activate abilities as much as you want. And so one of the, the cool curves with Mightstone Weakstone is you play it and draw two cards or get minus five, minus five to target creature. And then you tap it for mana and use it to activate Nykthos. Um, so that's a you know, play pattern that comes up with it not infrequently. And I guess a note about Mightstone Weakstone. So in terms of what it's in my sideboard, I used to I used to make a copy of it. This is before Pelucronos was printed. And I used to have a bunch of other reasons for why I played it. Uh, I have since moved past all of those reasons. Th there is exactly one reason right now that the Mindstone Weakstone is in my sideboard, and that is as five mana to destroy target shield rid. You, you can also destroy shield rid with transmogrifying wand, but that leaves a two four behind. Um, and like if Karn is your only threat, then it's easy for like Karn to get pressured down when you really want a second wish out of the Karn. So I, I still Rakdos is the most popular matchup, and shield rid is one of their best cards. And so if 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 Rakdos was not a popular deck, I would not play Mindstone Weakstone, but I have it in my sideboard, and it's explicitly as destroy target shield rid, and that's it. It's the only reason I have it in the sideboard. And it's going to do that here. And so here you see, you know, I get my Karn taken down, my Old Growth Troll got destroyed, but I'm still in, like, pretty... I'm still in reasonable shape. Um, and so here I'm going to do the play pattern I described before. And here I, I don't, you know, try to block um, to defend Karn at all, because I'll lose both my elves. But the th there's nothing good for Kikijiki to copy here, and the thing that I really care about is getting the shield rid like out of here because then it allows me to like race back more effectively because i'm gonna have a blue that's gonna be flipping and then i have like an old growth troll and i'm gonna get to sack the old growth troll that's enchanting the land get another four four so i've got um how much power 14 power coming at them two turns from now and 10 power coming at them this turn so i'm like pretty interested in getting shield rid out of the way because that clears the way for both of the four fours on like all the subsequent turns, and specifically, it's also because I like had the Pelucranos and the Troll in my hand, like to set this up. This is why I got the Mindstone Weakstone instead of something else like, like Sky Sovereign. Like against Rakdos, the most common thing that you fetch is Sky Sovereign to kill, you know, Blood Tithe Harvester, Bone Crusher Giant, Flipped Fable of the Mirror Breaker, um, Grave Bear Trespasser, but Shieldred here seemed like the most relevant card, and so I went with went with that. Um, and I drew a Karn, which is great, so now I, you know, win the game on the spot. It could have been the case that I needed to, like, sort of do, an, you know, this awkward dance of, you know, just attacking with my stuff and hoping it worked out. I mean, Pelucranos, when you transform it into Pelucranos Reborn, it has lifelink. And, you know, it's pretty hard to get race back. Um, this is a preview for match five, game one. But... Here I was just thinking through the things I could do, but I mean I have cards, so like the game team's over at this point, and I'm I would get Cityscape Leveler, but you know Derek concedes, so that's that's the end of this game. But you know the, the sand, for example, looks quite good. So I've got 
you know, Elf, Wolf Willow Haven, Oath, Two Lands, Karn. Like, this is like close to a perfect hand. Like, the kind of hands that you really want to keep are, and not just in Reinforced Practice, but like in general, are hands where you can have an, an Elf, Two Lands, and a Wolf Willow Haven. And that's because, like, even if Elf dies, you can Wolf Willow Haven. But if Elf doesn't die, then you can play the Wolf Willow Haven on the land and then tap it for two right away and, like, do something else, like more Elves or, like, an Oath of Nyssa. Here I have the choice between, let's see, I got Beseju, Forest, and Kiora. Um, there's kind of some tension here. Like, I mean, the Forest is a would be pr as a pretty good take. Um, but based on what's happened so far, I, I take the Kiora. And th th this is a line with, not without some amount of, of risk. Um, particularly because if the Kiora gets Thought Seized, then that's actually kind of pretty bad for me because now if the, the, the on board there's a blood tithe harvester which can kill the elf right and so if i want to play the asikas chariot then i lose a, i don't like net go up a land drop because nikthos is legendary and i'm just gonna be like kind of behind um however you know there's a lot of three drops in the deck right and so ginger makes what i, I believe it's still the correct play of going with uh playing his Fable of the Mirror Breaker instead of Thought Seizing Me, which allows me to play the Kiora. And so I missed a land drop on this turn because I, I took, I specifically because, you know, I took the, the Kiora over the land. And this, I think, is a pretty close judgment call. Like, I think it's totally justifiable to take either of those there. Um, but the, to get to the reason why I took Kiora, it's because I, there, there's no Dread Border, and it's, um, there are two Noxious Grasps in the sideboard that Ginger brings in that could kill the Kiora. But if that doesn't happen, um... And I'm able to play Cavalier of Thorns, which will draw a card and get a land. That I think I'm in extremely good shape to win the game, like much better in much better shape than if I just um, than if I just sort of play Chariot and and Karn on Curve. Um, however, there's there's he does apparently have a Thought Seize, and so he is able to Thought Seize my Cavalier of Thorns. So this sort of pokes a pretty significant hole in my plan but this plan still works out extremely well if i can draw like any you know, trip, like you know, a cavalier of thorns pelucranos old growth troll or storm the festival like all those would be extremely good top decks here because ginger isn't able to attack down my cure on this turn because he doesn't have enough mana to animate his creature land um so my cure is pretty safe at least for this turn so this is a turn where i kind of like really need to rip um and I do, I do, I draw the best card, which is Storm. So this is, uh, this is, you know, this this is one of the payoffs for taking the line that that I took. Um, so I have to, you know, Lotus Petal one of my Nykthoses to do this, but this, this is a, this is a really good outcome. And it may look like, oh, Bobby got so lucky, like he talked like the Storm. But I mean, you put these cards in your deck for a reason, like it's to draw them, and you know, you're not playing a deck of like you know, a couple small ball threats and, you know, removal spells. You're, you're not playing a mid-range deck, you're playing a ramp combo deck. And so having sequences like this happen is the payoff for playing a ramp combo deck. This is, this is why you put the cards in your deck. Um, and so here, what are my choices between? So it's between Troll, Wolf, Will, Haven, Second Cura. It's not like a Troll... Not a pun. It's not a troll here that I pause because the thing is, so if you have a cure on the battlefield and you get a storm, a second cure, and a four power creature, both cures will trigger. So you you do draw a second card. So if I had gotten Kiora and Troll, I would have drawn two cards. Um, and so I was weighing the option between having a Kiora on seven loyalty versus three, plus a random card versus a Wolf Willow on the battlefield. I end up going with wanting the wolf wall on the battlefield because on board like uh, you know here i'm just gonna sort of assume that my cure is gonna die because you know it could he has ginger if he plays a land he has the option of animating the den like sort of full sending it a cure but even if that does happen right now so the the way i think about nykthos is it taps for devotion minus two so right now assuming cure dies my devotion would be six so i think of Nykthos is tapping for 6 minus 2, which is 4. So Nykthos taps for 4, and the lands tap for for 3, so that's 7. And so I'd... Right now, where my thought is at is because even if I draw a Wolf Will Haven, which, which I did, like unless I also draw like a land on the following turn, I can't get full value out of the Wolf Willow. Because right now, I can't put Wolf Willow on the Nykthos and activate Nykthos for Devotion, and I can't tap 
like it basically doesn't work out um to sort of get being like net neutral on mana for this wolf wolf unless i draw a land and so for that reason i think that sort of you know it's like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush so i, I take the the wolf wolf and put it and put it on the forest so it's I just wanted to communicate that there's an actual decision there about what, what to take between the troll, the cure, and the wolf of haven. So that's uh that's sort of what was going on there. Okay, so here because I was able to have, you know, a moderately good storm, now the plan Ginger had before of just playing Shieldred like doesn't really work out anymore. So he rearranges that away. And just draw a good card, so he draws Croxa, and he, he can escape it here, so what I'm trying to avoid when he does go f to play the Croxa is getting rid of Karn. Because, like, Karn, I'm going to have exactly enough to... I'll, I'll have to lose my Kiora, but I'll have exactly enough to just keep leveler. So I, I can definitely tell, like, he drew something relevant when he, like, doesn't go to animate his Den of the Bugbear. Because on, on board, he, he does have the ability to take out my Kiora, like, guaranteed, Right? And so when he doesn't do that, I can tell something is up. And he tanks He tanks for a pretty long time on this turn. And I actually... I kind of think that it would have been better to just take out the Kiora. Because... I don't, I don't think I revealed the Karn. Yeah, I, I think I naturally drew the Karn. I think that was like the first... That was like an early draw step or something. Um, but the, the, the Karn's ability to, to cityscape level is, you know, sort of outclasses basically anything else. Um, but yeah, I'm going to keep Karn here over anything else, because, I mean, neither of the other two cards stands up to answering a Kroxa, but with a cityscape leveler, I can, I can answer that. And here what I'm actually going to do is when I when I go for the Cityscape leveler, what I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy the the flipped reflection of Kiki-Jiki. And the reason for that is one of the ways I could realistically lose the game is reflection, copying reflection, and like making, you know, an army of tutus and attacking me down with them. Because once you have, you know, double reflection going, you can, even if like one of the originals gets destroyed, you can keep floating copies like through end step sacrifices. And so once your opponent ever assembles two copies of Reflection of the Mirror Breaker, it's pretty hard to get them off of it. And so for this reason, I prioritize killing the Reflection of Kiki Jiki. Because I, I have an answer to the Kroxa. The answer is I'm going to have a Cityscape leveler in play, and that's an 8 8. And I can block Kroxa. Like, that's fine. That's no problem. I mean, this is week two drawing a removal spell for Kroxa, but two of the removal spells are go for the throats. So there's only. A braid and there's some other doom blade variant um i forget at this moment the exact deck list i was playing against let me just double double check but i think there's only only two of the four doom blades can enter yes yeah, so there's two go for the throats one power word kill and one a braid and so um so the Cityscape Leveler is relatively hard to kill. Um, I guess it also could be Extinction Event. Um, but here, if Extinction Event on... It would have to be on Even, which would take out the token, the Goblin Shaman token, and the Kroxa. So that doesn't seem like a super realistic outcome. Um, the one the one sad, sad, I guess I put that in quotes, thing here about the Cityscape Leveler line is that I don't get to draw a card because I have to bend my cure. I mean, I'll, I'll survive, you know, well, 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 woe is me. Um, but it is realistic for me to, like, potentially lose the game from the spot. Um, but it, it would be tough. It would certainly be tough, particularly because Karn, you know, has the Stony Silence ability on it, and so that shuts off the redraw on the blood. At least for now, it does. Um... Pretty sure what happened on this turn is so Derek's gonna go for an attack with everyone where he's gonna animate the den and sort of full swing. And the point of this is it's gonna allow Karn to be destroyed and that'll open up the option to use the artifacts, use the blood to, to you know, cycle this to rest. But the upside for me and I guess downside for Derek is, you know, this attack gives me the best, you know, possible blocks, which is. I'm allowed to put Cityscape Leveler on Croxa and Old Growth Troll on 
den of the bugbear. Um, so I get to eat the den, I get to eat the Kroxa, and the only thing that's left is a goblin token, a reflection, and a goblin shaman token. And so it is technically possible like to lose from here, but it would be pretty difficult, especially because on board I'm able to attack for 12 damage and blow up the reflection. So I guess if Derek draws Extinction Event, he can do that for um, for even. That would take out everything except for my troll. At that point, I would have attacked for 12, so he'd be down to 6. So he'd have exactly one more turn to draw an answer to my troll, but then he would also need another answer to my troll the following turn. Like, she'll, she'll do kind of the full answer for both, but if it's a removal spell, then he needs like to draw two running removal spells. Um, so that's... Basically, what I'm saying my spot is pretty good, and it looks like he did draw the extinction event. But again, like he is in still a pretty rough spot even through that. And here, ooh, this is nice. So I I draw um, I draw a Nykthos, and this is um, enough to flash back my storm, which is good, because this means that like, he he now he can't extinction event. I don't, know, I don't know he has extinction in his hand, but like you're always trying to like play around it if you, if you can, because that's usually the highest impact card. And so if I can make both even and odd untenable, then you know then, then you win. And so here I get you know two you know good creatures, and this sort of makes it impossible for him to to win, because now I can blow up the um, the fable. And so this forces putting Derek, he's going to take 12 down to 6. And now whether he goes even or odd, he's still going to lose. Because I can blow up, you know, a token. Or I blow up, like, you know, whatever, any permanent. Like, even, yeah, I don't know what could have got. I guess if, the other thing is that even if he draws, you know, a removal spell for the Cityscape Leveler, so if he goes Extinction Event, odd, and has a two mana, you know, removal for my cityscape leveler. I can still just, you know, I'm still drawing one card a turn, so I can eventually draw the mana to just like flash back the cityscape leveler. Sorry, unearth the cityscape leveler, and I has haste, and I can attack and like destroy something again. But it ends up being good enough because he, you know, just draws a land. So feeling pretty good, pretty, pretty, pretty good. So that was, that was. See, that was match three, so uh, I'm 3-0. At this point, I've essentially I've won the grudge match, you know, feels feels good. Derek's probably not not feeling great now. And uh, we're, we've, we're, we're not, I mean, it's like, a, it's like a best of five, but we're, we scheduled time to like to play five matches, so we're going we're gonna to play all five matches. Um, but I think we've already decided who the, the better of the, the top decks of the format is. It's mono green. Um, but yeah, so here, you know, we're, we're going again and here you saw like the, the contours of what are the limits for me of a keepable hand. Um, and yeah, that, that first hand just had like no realistic route to like win the game. Um, and so I, I pitched it and I think in the game that ends up being pretty painful to so here, you can see like, you know, this elf is a very bad mana source. Like if, you know, this elf happened to be the elf that I boarded out for Dark Citadel and I drew a Dark Citadel instead of an elf, then I wouldn't have lost my elf to a removal spell. I could have played the Kiora and then played my, my old world troll. Um, I would have been like significantly better shape than I was. Um, but I draw another elf and then my elf's going to eat another removal spell and I'm going to die. Um, so this game actually ends up being over like pretty, pretty quickly. And this is demonstrates a couple of things. Like one, this is not, you know, an elf centric matchup. Like your, your elves are gonna die and you, you need mana sources. Um, so elves are not good. Like you, you, again, you can't you can't mulligan, but you wanna not draw elf heavy hands. And you all, one common like sort of meme about playing mono green is that people are like, oh, you know, if you have your, an elf and it dies and you lose the game. And if you don't have a turn one elf then you're like forced to mulligan. This is like not true. I mean, it's, it's like matchup dependent. Um, there's some matchups where you, do have to mulligan like to an elf pretty aggressively, um, but this matchup is not one of them. And so here, yeah, my hand just gets picked apart more, and I basically have 
almost no mounts. Like if, if I drew an overgrowth troll on specifically this turn instead of a land, I theoretically maybe could have won. I mean, I probably still wouldn't have. Um, but it, it could have happened. But here, here I'm like super dead. So yeah, that was that, and I died very quickly and uninteractively. And sideboarding is still the same as always. You know, it's always minus two elves, plus Dark Seal Citadel, plus Seekus Chariot. And this is going to be this is the other time that I mulligan this match. Um, and so yeah, this is this hand is too bad. So this this hand is basically a five card hand. So like. The second copy of Nykthos, it can be like a colorless Lotus Petal, where you can like play it and like get a mana out of it once. But if you have three Nykthoses, like these Nykthoses do not count as as mana sources. So this is basically a five card hand, and I, I, I would I basically mulligan a five card hand to a six card hand by mulliganing that hand. Um, so that, that if you want examples of of what kind of hands I'm willing to mulligan, so this hand of game two match four is one of them and then you can look at the, the other hand um in game one of the same match and so the, the, this is the bar for mulligating but like there's a really high bar for mulligating um so the, these two hands sort of met that but in general you you just don't mulligan the deck just, just don't do it in, in this matchup i mean other, other matchups like against like lotus field for example like hidden strings lotus field you, you mulligan extremely aggressively but against rakdos you just, just don't mulligan um, and here you're actually going to see the power of, you know, Misery Shadow. So Misery Shadow is um, the best conceivable card in the entire format against Mono Green out of Rakdos. And I actually, with my Moto Tracker, I, I talk about my Moto Tracker a lot, but the person who makes the Moto Tracker very generously agreed to an idea that I, I proposed, which is adding a tab for the win rate of on a per match basis of spells you play against. So what I'm able to do is I can take my deck, I can filter just to Rakdos matches and see what my win rate is based on the cards my opponent plays. I can, I can, you can already do this for cards that, that you play, but you can also do it for cards your opponents play. And if you're interested in the Moto Tracker, I'll leave a link down below and maybe eventually I'll make a video explaining like how to set it up. But the documentation is pretty self-explanatory, but if you're not like a technical person, it might be kind of confusing. But uh, Misery Shadow is, bar none, the best card in the format against mono green because it is a card that i have the most negative win percentage against so my in post and it basically only comes up in post board games um people i mean it's just as good in, in you know game ones but not everyone main decks it right now derek's list you know mains two but i in terms of versus my average win rate in games where my opponent casts a misery shadow my win rate is negative 12.5 percent versus my my average win rate so my average win rate in post board games is let's see here 69.6 percent nice and in games where i put cast a misery shadow it's 57.1 percent so i still you know i'm always favored to like win any specific game in, in my data but misery shadow is a card i am most negative against and it's for exactly the reason you saw in this game. Like I played some old growth trolls, and they just ate generic removal spells. Like if it wasn't for Misery Shadow in play, the old growth troll would have died into a mana source, and I would have Cassie's Cavalier of Thorns in the Storm of the Festival, and I like would have like trivially won the game against you know any other creature that wasn't Misery Shadow. But Misery Shadow is like the the be all end all because it turns cards which would normally otherwise be like completely irrelevant into like best possibles of you know exile target creature instead of just destroy because the difference between destroy and exile is very significant because with troll it means denying a mana with cavalier it means denying the putting a card back on top so misery shadow is like a pretty big deal and then the other thing that um i mean ginger even said this specifically at the end of our games um this is something that i i didn't talk about it you know in our in a, you know synchronous debrief but i push back on it i'll push back on it now if you're, if you're playing reactors and you're watching this because you want to learn how to beat green um extinction event is not good like, it, it does not actually affect the outcome of the game. And I'll, I'll tell you right now. So in my data, um, I win 2%, 2.3% more than average in games where my opponent casts Extinction Event than when they don't cast Extinction Event. So Extinction Event is actually worse than not having Extinction Event in your deck against green. I realize this might seem kind of counterintuitive, um, but the green player like if they're playing intelligently there's like ways that they can like mitigate the impact of extinction event um I, I mean most people probably don't play around extinction event to the extent that i do so it probably is net positive win percentage for the reactive player against most green opponents but if your green opponent is like very good extinction event is actually 
an actively bad card. Um, I, I don't expect the entire audience like to believe this, but um, I, I am usually pretty happy when my opponent draws Extinction Event. Um, and if you disagree, then you know comment down below. It will drive engagement, so you know everybody wins. That that's probably one of the more controversial. That's probably the second most controversial thing in this video, besides just like do do not mulligan. Um, so that's that's my rant on extinction event. And uh, okay, so here we're getting into match five. So I'm still up three and one. I still already won the grudge match, and here we're going into, into match five. And uh, this one, I won't spoil it, but this one this one's gonna be pretty good. This this one's kind of a doozy, um, especially this this game one. So here. Here I do have a bit of an option. So here I can I do have the fifth land this time, or the fifth mana source this time, so I can go Karn minus for Sky Sovereign. Or I could Kiora and Pelucranos and draw a card. And like I guess both these options are kind of tempting. Here I end up going with the Pelucranos just because I'm kind of never going to have another good option to deploy this later. And it's pretty hard. It's game one. It's like, you know, it's pretty hard for this to all get answered cleanly. But this line is... I mean, the thing is, if I if I had gotten a Sky Sovereign, like it would have gotten Thought Seized anyways, and then I guess the, you know the way that this draw worked out, where he you know drew into like two Thought Seizes, um, so he didn't have the Thought Seizes when I like was making the choice, but it, 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 I think it was kind of close. I think if I if I only had one of Pelucranos or Kiora, I would have gone for the Karn line, but just like I mean, you're like up cards, like you know, it's just pretty good. So I do end up going with the the. The draw card line with Kiora, and Ogre was actually a pretty good draw here. So I'm on board. I'm able to flip the the Pelucranos into Pelucranos Reborn um, with the Ogre Troll. I can still do that and like a Muppet card. Um, so you know we're we're going in, and here this other Kiora is like not really doing anything. So I think the most it can do is I can just play it to give the Pelucranos Vigilance because I don't know. There's like some reality where there's like a removal spell on the Troll. And then I get out tempoed. I guess if if there if, there would probably need to like be a creature land for this line to be correct. I probably should have held the Kiora, but I wanted to give the Pelucranos vigilance on this turn. But I guess the other thing is like if Pelucranos dies, it dies into two hydras, which can block. But I guess if Pelucranos isn't untapped, it'll never get destroyed on this turn. So I don't know. There's like maybe a little bit of tension there. The other thing is that the Kiora is like not doing anything. The most it can do is like, Fireball the Lair next turn, but there's going to be, you know, a Chump Blocker for that in the Goblin Shaman token, so it's unclear how much that does. Um, but this game actually is going to go on for kind of a while, because we're going to do this arm wrestling match between Pelucranos and Shieldred. Um, yeah, this... Oath, unfortunately, just, like, kind of totally breaks... I mean, I guess, in the strictest sense, like, Besaju is not a total brick because it answers Fable, but right now there's, like, nothing good for Fable to copy on board, so I'm, like, not actually that concerned about the Fable. Um, one play I do make here, and this is probably a mistake, is I attack with... So I'm going to make a... I'm going to make a big lair. I'm going to channel Besaju on the Kiki Jiki, and... I'm going to attack with Troll. Attack with Troll is probably wrong, because, like, so here I'm able to get Lair up to exactly a 10, because I'm not going to tap the... I have 10 mana flowing right now, I'm going to tap the 4, so I get a 10. So I attack with Pelucranos, and I can attack with a big Lair. It's also possible maybe even attacking with the Pelucranos was bad, but the thing is, like, the... I want to get in some amount of damage, because then on future turns, like, I, I need my opponent to be at a life total such that other creatures beyond you know, a big lair can threaten lethal. And I thought maybe getting with, like... I wanted to deny the ability of Shieldred to block the lair or the Pelucranos. Um, but I, know, I think it was probably just wrong. I probably shouldn't have attacked with the troll. I think that was that was almost certainly a mistake. Because um, I was thinking about wanting to sack the troll land to draw a card with Kiora, but I guess I was also making a pretty big assumption that my opponent wouldn't have another... Like I was imagining their hands was going to be removal spells and not creatures, because if they have essentially any creature that gives, you know, a good blocker to copy with Kiki-Jiki, and they can leave that back on defense to not get killed on this turn, while also using Shielder to kill Kiora. So this is probably a mistake attacking with the troll, and apparently, like, you know, Ginger had a 
bone crusher the whole time, and he drew another bone crusher. So the thing is, but he, another reason why this line is bad is that Ginger can also he can like draw like any creature, like literally any creature. I guess besides the redundant children is good here because it gives them something to copy with Kiki Jiki. Here, this is kind of this is actually you know pretty. This is honestly actually a very good creature from to draw because it's it's like multiple creatures, so he can channel Sokens on and it costs one less because there's a, a shield rid. And now he has like two good blockers for like a big lair and Pelucranos because he's at six. So this turn he has like two force chomp blocks. Um, and I do, I do like, you know, for, force these chomp blocks um, by, you know, attacking with, with my stuff. Um, so this is where the arm wrestling between Pelucanos and Kiora starts. Remember, remember the Pelucanos were born, or the the, the, the backside of Pelucanos. Um, it has lifelink, so I mean, I'm getting you know six life a turn, and it also has Hydra synergies. So it says whenever a Pelucanos or a non-token Hydra you control dies, you make it's, it's like a worm coil engine, so it makes a three three Phyrexian worm with reach and a three three Phyrexian worm with lifelink. So instead of death touch and lifelink, it's reach and lifelink. So Ginger can, like you know can't realistically kill one like when I animate with big lair and attack with it. You know it dies into two three threes, which is pretty good defensively. Um, but I mean here here it's like you know chomping one no matter what, so it's not does make a huge difference. One thing that I do this game that I think is a pretty clear mistake. I don't know if it's this turn or a future turn. Is I sacrificed the old growth troll, and the reason why this is a mistake is like it means I don't have enough mana to like do stuff in the future. So like here, imagine I sacrifice the old growth troll land, right? And I at that point I'm down to three devotion because I guess one thing to note about Pelucrans, if you don't already know, is that the transforms like the backside of a trans of, of a normal double face transform card a transforming double face card is that the back face does not contribute to devotion um so like it copies the mana value so for example right now the the Pelucranos has mana value three even though it's not printed there because the transforming double face card takes the mana value from the front side but no other properties from the front side are copied it's like you pretend the front side doesn't exist except for determining the mana value and this was a rules change that happened i think around the first return to innistrad set of been shadows over innistrad i think it's somewhere somewhere around there they changed they changed the rules because, like, you know, it used to be back in the day, like, if you played original Innistrad Standard, you could use a Ratchet Bomb to, like, destroy a flipped Huntmaster of the Fells and the Wolf. But they decided they wanted to change the rules there. So now the back side of a Transforming Double Face card has the mana value of the front side. So it has mana value of the front side, but nothing else. So the Pelucrans doesn't contribute Devotion. And so here you see the punish for doing what I did, which is the 4-4 token I made by sacking the Old Growth Troll Land doesn't really accomplish anything. But... Um, like in terms of you know opening up attacks, but it, one thing it definitely does it denies me a lot of mana. So like just naturally being a land attack for, for two mana, that's you know two mana, and then the three devotion is three more mana. So I'm I'm denying myself essentially five mana to make a four four token, which is a lot of mana. Because um, I mean even beyond the token, it's the, the 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 token itself. I'm also like denying myself five mana, which means I can't make like a big layer because like layer to be you know quote unquote relevant needs to um be be a be a five five to be able to attack like into shield rid and so i can't do that here i think i, I am it anyways because i'm like i mean the thing is if the layer gets blocked it dies into into two three three tokens because of pelucranos but it would have been better just to be able to like make big layers and like you know a bunch of turns in a row and like keep attacking um, and there's ways for that to not work out, but I think it was a pretty clear mistake to bin the old growth troll land, and it's especially apparent now because now so now I only have five mana available. Because when you have three devotion, Nykthos doesn't net any mana. You need it taps for like D minus two, and so you you if you use a devotion ability, and so you need at least four devotion to like be making extra mana, and so now. Even if I draw a storm, which is usually like the best possible spell, it doesn't do anything, which is really bad. Um, so here I'm like really kicking myself for playing the old growth troll, or for attacking the old growth troll land, and to make the four four token because it didn't, it didn't really accomplish anything. I mean, look, Ginger's now at 
11 life. He's going to gain a lot more life this game. So, like, the 4-4 token, like, didn't really accomplish anything. And denying myself 5... Like, 5 mana is a lot of mana. You know, you don't... 5 mana is like nothing just new to that. Um, so, now I finally decide, okay, I'm, just, I'm done attacking now. Um... Well, I guess I'm gonna play with Polygrams because you know it's six six, but uh, I'm just trying to like chill and survive and get to the cityscape level or mana. And this is, I guess, this holding pattern we're gonna have right here kind of goes on for a while. So let's see here. So yeah, the, the fatal push. You know, it's revolted now because tra the transforming. The exiling and transforming of the, of the reflection. So my blue gets taken out. I get, you know, two more worms. Not the end of the world. Um, but I don't have a tax the shield right now. And Ginger is gaining a lot of life. A lot of life. With the shield red. So I'm just waiting to draw mana. And this guy has mana. So here, this old world troll, like, Playing it, this represents three devotion, which is three mana. So even if the troll dies, well, if the troll doesn't die, it's worth plus three mana. But if it does die, then it's worth plus four mana. Um, imagine if I still had that old world troll that I sacrificed like several turns ago. You know, I could have just already cast a cityscape level and I would have won. Um, but I didn't, and so here I am. Well, the nice thing is, you know, I mean. The, the city of over my hand is very safe because even if there's a thought seize for it, there needs to also be a, um, there needs to also be a graveyard trespasser, which is only two copies of, in order to, to exile it from the graveyard. So I'm feeling pretty good at this point because it's I can't really be gotten off of the mana to cast the city escape level. There's like no mechanism for that in game one. Um, and because here I'm just trying to like delay the game. I mean I'm at 38, like I reasonably take this damage, but the thing is the, also the troll. Um, blo blocking here like opens up, I think, good attacks for my three threes on future turns. Like when I need to go start clocking with the leveler, or maybe it doesn't. I think it's, this block doesn't really make a big difference. I'm just like interested in preventing damage, even though I'm at thirty eight. Because like I, the asymptotics of this are like I need to, you know, sort of attack eventually. And may maybe the other reason to do it is because there's, um, I guess right now I don't have good attacks because there's the reckoner bank buster to make it to be a four four, and so I just want to. Um, be able to open up attacks for the troll token I make in the future. Because I guess, like, before I was saying, you know, I don't want the token anymore, but if I get rid of shield red, then I do want the token again. Um, so, that's that's a thing. But here, I finally get to cast my Cityscape Leveler, and I get to take out the shield red. Or, sorry, not the shield red. Yeah, here I take out the Reflection of Kiki and that's because, okay, so the shield red doesn't have attacks anymore. Um, and the leveler could take out the shield on the following turn, but at this point I'm kind of in like denying card draw mode. And one thing Kiki Jiki can do is okay, so you can crew the Reckoner Bankbuster, and then you can copy it with Kiki Jiki. And what you get, you get an unanimated, so it's it's not a creature, it's it's, a, it's just like a blank Reckoner Bankbuster, but it has three counters on it. And this means that you can tap the copy of the Bankbuster, which is not a creature, to draw a card. So basically here in Kiki Jiki, it can be used like to draw a card. Um, and I, here, I just want to deny card draw because I, I want to deny, like, a um, go for the throw doesn't count, but a braid does count. A braid and power word kill on my cityscape leveler. Because if it gets killed, the cityscape leveler, then I, I can unearth it, but I only get, like, one attack in. And, you know, okay, so, you know, Derek's back at 21 now. I told, I told you I'd gain a lot of this game. And so the shieldred, um, taking out the shieldred is, like, fine, but I, I, my 3-3s three don't have attacks into the Reckoner Bank Buster, and so it would take, like, a lot of attacks of old growth roll to, to get through. Um, so, that's why that's why I took out the Kiki Jikis, because he could crew Bank Buster, um, copy Bank Buster, and draw a card. So, that's why I did that, and thankfully, you know, with, with Rakdos, there's always this sort of dance, like, what two-mana removal spell do you play? There's so many Doomblade variants, which one is the right one? You know, it's, it's this fine dance. But here the dance worked out for me, because Ginger's two of his Doomblade variants are two go for the throats, and Cityscape Leveler is an artifact creature, so it's wearing a scarf. It does not have a throat to be gotten. Um, so that's, that's fortunate for me. Here, I don't actually have attacks, though, and the reason is, so... 
Ginger Drew into a Kroxa. I think if, if I take a City Scale Blobo, so I can, I can take out Kroxa, and then he can, like, block with Shieldred and, like, bring back Kroxa. And I only get, like, one more Unearth with, with my City Scale Blobo. Like, I can't. I, I don't get to use it forever, right? Um, and he has the ability to bring it back at least once and, you know, probably easily, you know, two more times this game. So if I attack with Cityscape Leveler, I actually might get outground by this Croxa. It's like a very real possibility. Um, if I draw like only Forest, like every turn for the rest of the game. And so here I just don't attack with Cityscape Leveler because if I just keep this holding pattern, like I mean, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of cards I want to draw to, if I draw a Karn, if I draw a Cavalier of Thorns, if I draw a Storm of the Festival, like I have a bunch of cards that just sort of like totally own Ginger right now. And he kind of doesn't have, it's game one, so there's like no extinction event to draw to. He doesn't have cards that do the same thing. Um, and so for that reason, I'm just okay chilling. Cause like I could theoretically lose to like Crocs are coming back two more times if I like do stuff here. But if I just chill, then I think I'm fine. I mean, if, if there, if he draws into a Doomblade variant that can kill City Skip Leveler, then that's a little bit bad for me. I can still, like, multi-block the Croxa and the Shieldred and, like, you know, keep keep getting, like, more draw steps. Um, but here I think it's fine to not attack. I guess the one other thing that could happen is if Croxa attacks. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to block the City Skip Leveler if Croxa ever attacks. But that opens up Bone Crusher Giant being an answer. I mean, I think that's fine. But it is, like, sort of one of the risks. It might be a reason why, if a Croc attacks, I might do something like, um... I could, like, triple block with the tokens. I could also block, like, two tokens and an old growth roll. There's, like, some... There's, I mean, there's some choices there. Um, but here I don't attack. Because here, I mean, I have so many... Like, if I draw Karn, you know, Cavalier of Thorns... Storm, I'm just, like, gonna win. Even if the Storm doesn't... Even if the Cavalier of Thorns doesn't mill into a Storm, like, it just being able to get back a card in my graveyard will, you know, probably win me the game. So I'm pretty content to just chill. And I guess watching Ginger's hand now, it looks like... I'm, I'm very glad that that was a go-for-the-throat and not an Abrader or Power Word kill. I think this might have been a game where he went through the Power Word kill earlier. Or maybe I'm thinking of... No, I think that was this game i think like i had an elf that got power world word killed pretty early in this game i can't can't entirely remember and here that, that's what you saw Yeah, so that was good. So it's match five. We're up three matches to one. We're up a game. It's like looking pretty good. You know, when I asked a bunch of, you know, my friends what they thought the outcome of this grudge match was going to be, basically everybody said four and one. Because, um, I mean, my, my win rate in the matchup, like I, I mentioned earlier, it's like 77.8%, I think, something like that. So my overall, like, win rate in the matchup is... You know, quite, quite good. Yes. Oh, sorry, 77.2%. So 61 wins and 18 losses. Um, but, I mean, I think it's totally within reason to go, like, 3 and 2. I, basically, at no point, you know, when I was offering to do this, this grudge match with Ginger, did I ever think I would, like, lose by going, like, 2-3 or worse. Like, that was just, like, sort of not on my radar. I mean, of course it could happen, but I thought it was, like, pretty unlikely, because... This is going to be like a somewhat controversial statement. I think green is at least a, at least a little bit favored um, for sort of like the structural reasons that we've been over in this grudge match. But there is a way to lose. Uh, in fact, here you're gonna you're gonna see one of the ways that I lose right now, which is a turn two misery shadow. It's like it's like very hard to beat. Um, I, I know it seems like kind of uh, reductive to say that like you just have a misery shadow on turn two, you're gonna be green. But th that's like the honest reality because like as you see here. You know, there's a Fatal Push, and I'm going to have an Old Growth Roll, and if this Misery Shadow were any other card, this Fatal Push would be, like, pretty irrelevant, because it would ramp me into, you know, I'd play another Old Growth Troll, and then I'd play a Cavalier of Thorns and a Storm. Like, I would just, like, effortlessly win this game. But instead, there's these Fatal Pushes, which can kill my Old Growth Trolls, and they don't come back, and I don't get mana from them. Um, and that, that's a big deal. So if you 
are playing Rakdos and you do intend to beat green, the answer begins and ends at Misery Shadow. Like that that is the if you if you truly intend to beat green and that's like what you're trying to do with the cyborg slots or the main deck slots, it, it must be Misery Shadow. There there is nothing else that, that matters so much as Misery Shadow. And basically every game with a turn two Misery Shadow like that decided the entire game. And it usually does that. It, sometimes it doesn't, but it, if we're, I'm being honest, like usually if there's a turn two Misery Shadow, that's probably going to, to win. And so, yeah, so I lose this game. But that's what we have game three for. So, yeah, and then, yeah, the token off of the Fable. Makes a treasure and that gets pumped, so I'm a two. Yeah, man, I have no odds here, so you know I'm dead. Game three. Yeah, I, mean, I still, I still yeah, won the grudge match. You know, I, I won, I won at least three times. So I'm, I really want to get that fourth win. Really interested in it. All right, and here, okay, here again we have a hand that, I think this is a perfectly functional hand. So it doesn't have, the the one major downside of this hand, it doesn't have the third green source, but like we can draw like another green source, like in our top however many cards, like, that's fine. This, this is the kind of hand you keep. And then, so like, you know, we have a Cura, so if the Cura, you know, dies and we need to draw a green source again, but like, you, you don't mulligan, like you just, these are just the kind of hands you keep. So there's Thoughtseize and it takes a Cura, and so that's, you know, kind of sad. But you know, that's how it goes. We draw an elf. Elf is, like I mentioned, el elves are not reliable mana sources. Like if this elf, even if it had been like a Dark Souls, that would have been fine. Because that gets me closer to playing the Cav or the the Storm. But it's an elf, which is like the worst card because it dies. And then oh, we draw another elf. This is, this is, here, so here's why elves are bad. So here I have play Cure and I play an elf. And on my next turn, I'm going to have a tension between do I want to play, or do I want to play um, Cavalier of Thorns, which, which Ginger knows about, um, or do I play, so I'm going to draw Kiora, and like, do I want to play Kiora, or do I want to play Cav? And so the thing here is, so if I play Cav, that's not actually very good, because like, you always got to assume they have Extinction Event, like, what, what can you do to minimize the extent to which Extinction event impacts you, and so here it turns out that he did have an extinction event. But so if I if I do play the cav, and I, even if I hit a land, I'm actually still pretty far away from playing the storm because what I need to do is so on my next turn, I need to play Kiora. But if Ginger has a land on, like you know, the, for the, if he has extinction event and then another land the following turn, which apparently he actually has all this in his hand already wrapped up, then he can animate the den and attack down my Kiora from from seven to zero and kill my Kiora in one shot. And so now I'm still two mana away from playing the storm. And so what I go for here is I play the Cure, and the reason for this is even if there's a single removal spell, I can still like um, still cast Cav guaranteed if it's like a point removal spell. And if there's two removal spells, even I'm like I only need to draw a, like topic a land within the next two turns to play a Cav with Cure before Cure dies. But here I have the worst case scenario happen, which is that there's an extinction to take out both the elves. And this is this is why elves are atrocious cards in this match because they're not reliable mana sources. Like if they were literal basic wastes, I would be in significantly better shape this game because they would tap for mana, but they don't. Um, so this is this is why elves are bad. Um, and so if I even on, even on, on this turn, if I drew, you know, a, any even a colorless land, like I would be fine because I could just play the cab and I would draw a card with the cab with Cure and I would get a land. Um, but I drew a Karn. And so here, I mean, you, it might look like there's a tension here from the Karn not having the Dark Sisters they'll get. But the thing is, the Dark Sisters they'll here wouldn't have even helped because, so Ginger has the ability to animate the Den and attack down the Kiora and, and take some loyalty off the Karn. And so the, the result of this means that the Kiora is not going to be a mana source. And so I'm still going to be like another mana source away on the following turn, even if I was able to get a Dark Souls of the Bill here. So it doesn't actually cost me anything in the spot that I didn't have the Dark Souls of the Bill to wish for because I boarded it in. So it might, it might look like it does, but it doesn't actually cost one equity here though, although, even though it might, might look like it does. Um, yeah, so here I play Karn, and here I'm almost guaranteed the ability to minus with Karn on the following turn, because like the worst thing that can happen to me here in terms of my Planeswalkers getting attacked is going like untap land, animate den, attack, but 
three of the damage is like guaranteed spoken for going to the Kiora. And the reason for that is like Kiora, Kiora has to die because he, he knows about the cab in my hand. Um, so if I draw like an, if I draw an untapped land and I play cab, like I very easily win the game. So Kiora m must get killed. And so then there's four damage left from the den attacking. And so that's all going to go at Karn. And so Karn's going to die. Or sorry, sorry, Karn's not going to die. Karn's going to take four, go to two. And so this means like plusing Karn really just saves me a point of life because it means that and also preserves the ability to know what information, uh, it gives me more information to know like what card should I be taking on a future turn because like maybe something like else happens, and I actually there's no untapped land to attack the card and I want to get something else, um. So, that's that's why I went with with this play of plusing with cards that saved a point. Um. So, I made that play, and so here. O thing and there's still no land and what turn is it now it's turn six and i was on the play so we went through an oath we went through five draw steps so in our top in our top eight cards there was there were no green producing lands because we remember all three of these lands were all in our opening hand the opening hand was like lair nick those forest and like stuff it was like troll kiora something else so we've been through eight cards at this point and we haven't found a single like green producing land and i think i, I ran the numbers on this it's like i'm like more than 95 percent to have any green producing land on my top eight cards so now we're gonna lose but like if we had a green producing land like in the top eight cards like i think we were probably gonna win like i mean i guess this old growth troll would have been like a land instead of the forest but if there was basically any land like at any point, I think we're actually pretty heavily favored to win from this spot. Because even right here, like if I had been able to play an old world troll on this next turn, you know, right now I'm going to four thirteen. So if, if, I, if I drew like a four even here, so the the ninth card down, I play a troll. I can't be attacked at this point, and then the Nykthos, you know, functionally taps for two. I can play like another troll, and then I go like cab and a storm. So. We really just needed like to draw a single green producing land instead of like two useless elves to be able to win. So I think we were pretty close to winning this game, um, but instead we just like we literally didn't have a, t a land in our top nine cards and we lost. So I said my my, my win percentage of the matchup is in aggregate it's a total of seventy seven point two percent. I think I was you know pretty close to winning this last game and getting a four one. So I don't think it's a huge deviation to have gone only three and two in the grudge match instead of um, sort of four one. But I mean, it is what it is. Like I mean, there are spots where I got like a little bit lucky in, in you know the first three matches, but that's just sort of normal normal variance for you. Um, so that's that's the grudge match. I, I won. You know, I, there was I guess there was never a sweat. You know, I, I won the first three matches in a row. But that is green versus Rakdos. That concludes the five-match grudge match of Bobby on green versus misplaced ginger on Rakdos midrange. I hope you certainly learned something. And if that something was nothing else, it was do not mulligan against Rakdos. Just just don't mulligan. If you think if you think your hand is too bad, you probably still should not mulligan it. Like it needs, to, it needs to be really bad to mulligan. So just don't mulligan and you'll win more. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know I certainly enjoyed making it. And if you do decide to play green in the future, I hope that your devotion to green is always rewarded.